it's nefarious, man. Like the brain works in fucked up ways. The mind is one of the most deceiving, manipulative pieces of equipment, flesh, human bodies on earth. I never have trusted my brain. All of that weight lives in your head. And you are the decision maker. Psychology of entrepreneurship. Hi, it's Ronsley. If this is your first volume, welcome. This is a weekly series where I go inside the mind of an entrepreneur, artist, athlete, academic to decipher what is the psychology of our decisions. How's it going? So I get asked this a lot. What is the ROI of a podcast, Ronsley? I say I became godfather because of a podcast, but I suppose my meeting with my next guest happened like this. I remember bits and pieces of it. Um, I obviously remember uh, meeting you and liking you. And, and I. it's so funny because I just literally just thought you were a chef. Because we didn't get into you. You asked me to be on this podcast and, you know, get into the superfood thing and all of that stuff. So I didn't know all of the depth of you. I just knew that I had a good connection, great connection, good conversation. It's fun to be on this other side. I interviewed Darren on the Bon Appetit podcast four years ago. We kept in touch and he's now a client of Amplify. And we are helping him get his voice out into the planet. I think we might need some extra context here about Darren just a little bit because I'll highlight his amazingness at the end. But... Here is an insight to a couple of highlights from Darren's life. I feel like I am just getting going on some epic aspects of my life that are just now coming into fruition. So I feel like even though, yeah, there's some easy aspects uh, or benchmarks along the way that I have been a part of, you know, creating a, a superfood formula for beach body 10 years ago and it's on a on its own has sold 3.5 billion dollars that's crazy no one would have ever been able to understand that i can't even still computate that in my head so yeah i mean that's and then you realize the millions of people that have been able to consume something that ultimately is a passion of mine that really distills down to this. I want people to kick ass in their life. I want them to live a super life. I want them to be happy. I want them to not drag around this chemistry set of a body and exist. I want them to have what they want in life and to express it how they want to. Now, if we're sick and old and beaten up and sore from life, you can't do that very well. You can't live your dreams. If you're, you, you're limited in your infinity and your ability to dream, even just the ability to dream is limited by your limitations within your physicality and your mentality. And therein lies all of the unpacking that that is right. The, the, how you're living your life, what you're putting in your mouth? Uh, what do you care about? What, what's your view on yourself and, and, and what's your view on the world? What is that all about for you? And then, and then how are you taking responsibility for yourself and your life? To say that this human does amazing stuff is kind of an understatement. Today, we are going into the mind of a deeply connected entrepreneur who has had the most amazing and horrific things happen. This volume will explore the dichotomy we go through as entrepreneurs, artists, and creatives which fluctuate between grief and joy. So let's start at the beginning with more context as to how Darren shows up when he gets to a new place. Because since 2005, he has successfully sourced more than 300 foods and ingredients from around the world, working directly with people from Peru, Bhutan, the Amazon region, the Himalayas, 
the South Pacific and many other countries in Latin America, Asia, and Africa. When I show up to a place, I'm meeting the people, I'm getting to know them, and then in some cases, just meeting, communicating. When I get to be in those situations, you're then going, okay, how authentically have they been using this herb? I can read something online, but really, let's talk directly to these experts because you cannot find that information. Um, and so learning from that perspective and then backing into how they're growing it, why they're growing it a certain way before it's radically commercialized, because that's really what you're going to then end up being. And, and especially when you know you're selling you now have a benchmark of what you need, the standards that you need it in, the active compounds that you need to test it in, and then all of the, the certifications and auditing that needs to be the, that needs to be up to speed. But at the same time, indigenously, you're I'm all and I'm kind of the front person in that such situation most often because I am. You know, we have the audit teams that go around the world, but they're just in a facility, you know, under, you know, fake lights, checking to make sure rats aren't running around and, and you know, very basic. But but you, you come to realize that many facilities fail around the world. They fail. We fail over 90 percent of them before we can get them up to speed. So uh, unfortunately, the the sad part of the industry is you can sell that stuff and it's selling all over the place. And if you're not spending your time, your people, your money, making sure that, and you have a superfood company or you have an herb company or you have a tea company or you have um, some sort of mixture company or a food company that's not coming from your neighborhood, then you, you got to put your ass on a plane, on a train, on a, in some cases I've been on a water buffalo. Um, you need to show up. And, um, and that's the, that's the major difference. I'm not, I, I would never say I'm the smartest person in the room, but I'm a, I'm a ass kicker. The Awa are one of only two nomadic hunter gathering tribes left in the Amazon. According to Survival International, they're now the world's most threatened tribe. Their jungle home is being destroyed by illegal settlements and logging. Undercover investigators have filmed the loggers taking huge tree trunks out of the Awa's territory, but are powerless to stop them. The loggers are often armed, and activists say the Brazilian government has been too slow to tackle the problem. The actor Colin Firth has added his voice to Survival's new campaign, calling on Brazil's leaders for urgent action. That report was about logging companies exploiting Brazil's rainforest that have been accused by human rights organizations of using gunmen to wipe out the Awa. The Awa is a tribe of just 355 people. What the fuck is wrong with us? In 2020, the Indonesian government is planning to convert approximately 18 million hectares of rainforest into palm oil plantations. One of the easiest things to do is show up to a place without any context of how everything works, with solutions to problems that don't exist for the people of the place we show up to. That place can be a village, a company, a team, a family. We are quick with judgment and smart solutions. One of the most common debates is fair wages in developing countries. Dad? I, I show up. I love to show up and I love to learn in that way. So understanding culture is number one, making sure that those people are happy. They're happy with the scenario of the business relationship, um, that their wages are not extraordinary but they're just above average and that's that's a very important thing if they get paid too much then it's, it's equivalent as someone winning the lottery 
that is making $20,000 a year. And usually what happens within a year or two, these people are in worse conditions than they were before they won a lottery. So you have to be delicate, which is why you need to understand the culture. You have to understand through multiple conversations from multiple directions to understand what is fair for them. What are they getting paid now? What makes them happy or happier? That kind of reminds me of when Tucker Max said this in volume four. Like, I forget who said this. One of the quickest ways to ruin someone is to give them too much success too early. And um, uh, it's true, man. I've seen all kinds of people I know hungry, really want to either make a difference or make money or do a company or do something cool, whatever it is. They're hungry, right? They're, they're poor, broken, hungry, and that kind of drives them, and then they get some success or they get an exit, and then they're done. Do you know what makes you happy? Are you doing what makes you happy? Or are you waiting for some scenarios to change in your favor for you to do the things that makes you happy? Speaking about what makes us happy, do you know about Bhutan? So Bhutan is the neighbor of northern northern India, the neighbor of southern China. It's squashed in between these empires. And it's this kind of the last Shangri-La, as they call it, governing their country by gross national happiness, literally, pragmatically. So the best of their ability, they weigh every decision, every major decision, on their, on the effect that it has on the pillars that they've set up. And those pills, some of those pillars are things like, how will this affect our economy? How will this affect our society? How will this affect our communities? How will this affect um, our environment? Every decision. When you realize that it's not just this hot pie in the sky idea, that the culture that, that, Keep in mind, Bhutan is literally surrounded by 23 highest virgin mountains that have never been summited or populated. 23 of the highest virgin mountains in the world. So you might as well be on an island in the middle of the Pacific. You can't just leave. Like, especially for them. There's one airport. They own their airline. That's the only one flying in. So they're very protective of, of what they do and how they do it. Um, and it's not to say that they're the happiest people in the world, but damn, they're trying, right? So they're taking the conscious choice to listen. That if we do these things, it's going to affect our, our world. From, from that perspective, that by far was culturally the most kind of beautiful vulnerable and inspiring way to govern that I've, that I've seen. Come on. It's a daunting climb to one of the holiest sites in Bhutan. Tiger's Nest Monastery seems to defy gravity. Every Bhutanese is expected to complete the pilgrimage to ensure peace and happiness. When it became a democracy in 2008, Bhutan put happiness at the centre of all political policy, inspiring the UN to pass a resolution urging other nations to follow Bhutan's example. But how do you measure it? <laughs> For many Bhutanese, happiness is more intuitive than it is quantifiable, but ever since it became part of state policy, it's been described roughly as good governance, the balance between nature and economic growth, also between pleasure and work. In the capital, Timpu, is the world's only secretariat of happiness and a chief official who takes his job very seriously. The GNH index is found based on the nine domains and uh, close to 33 indicators. Things like health, education, living standard, environment, good governance. Uh, one is psychological well-being. The other one is community vitality, 
time use and cultural diversity. That was the start of a report done by Al Jazeera, a news channel, on Bhutan and how it goes about measuring its happiness index. I mean, there's no shortage of people out there trying their hardest to sell us stuff to make us happy. We buy things we don't need to impress people we don't like to live a life that doesn't make us happy. Because the pursuit of all the happiness in the world is quite useless when a natural disaster hits. Like um, the Californian fires of 2018. I was on a project, a TV film project. Uh, finishing up that, I was in the Amazon. We were just leaving this Amazonian city. Had a hotel, had internet. But then I heard uh, a couple texts. People said, there's a fire in Malibu. I'm like, oh, shit. I got a hold of my neighbor. Um, I said, yep, there's a fire. We haven't evacuated yet. I said, great. Okay. Well, I didn't say great. But I said, okay, so could you, before you leave, if you have to evacuate, can you grab some stuff out of my place? Yes. And then I'm gone. I'm on the Amazon. No cell reception. Nothing. And we get back and boom, I turn on my phone when we have reception and I got hundreds of text messages. And the ones obviously that stuck out was from my neighbor and I get this kind of running message of we had to leave, we couldn't get anything, the fire came, here's the pictures of your house. I'm sorry, it's all gone. And I was like, I'm just in shock I there's no there's no immediate place I could go for you know to deal with that it was just this overwhelm beyond moment that you can even compute so I'm out you know I'm in this and we have a few days of filming left I'm just in shock um I can't believe it. I didn't know how to talk about it. I know like in the production team was like, Hey, you don't have to do this. We can finish up without you if you want to, or if you want to talk about it on camera. So I, I started talking about it and within days, cause we were finishing up, I was back on a plane and the things that were the most shocking is like, I was on the road for on and off for three and a half months in nine countries. And I was exhausted on many levels. Now I'm so exhausted, I don't even have a pillow to go back to. And I'm sitting on the plane going, fuck, I don't have any of that. I don't have nothing. I don't know where I'm going. I have no place to go to. I can't even get to my property. Like all of this is hitting me on the plane. Where the fuck am I going? So I get back and a friend of mine I got a hold of and I got some random place in Venice and um, and then eventually about a week and a half later they opened up that canyon and I was able to get back and I came in my gate and just completely, 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 completely. When we come back, how does one process these kind of emotions when we lose everything? The main objective of this audio project is to bring together entrepreneurs and creatives who share similar values in a place where conversation can be had without judgment. A place where our listeners can give us constructive feedback to improve this show with topic and guest recommendations. For access to full-length interviews and access to that place, go to mustamplify.com slash P-O-E and click the button. Before the break, indigenous tribes, new measures of success and natural disasters. Now, what happens when you are out of the country and you hear this from your neighbors? We had to leave. We couldn't get anything. The fire came. Here's the pictures of your house. 
I'm sorry, it's all gone. What do you do? Can you imagine what you do in that scenario? Darren, that must have been painful. When you got back to see your property for the first time after the fire, when you got back from the Amazon, what was that scenario like? The scenario is that I live on 50 acres surrounded by a national park. It's gorgeous. And I, sh- yeah, and I showed up and there wasn't a sound. There wasn't a blade of grass. There was nothing of color in the entire, as far as I could see. It was, there wasn't a bug. There wasn't a bird. It was fucking smoke and black and white soot. Everything. Everything. Seeing it has a visceral part of grieving that really seeing that, oh, nothing survived. Not even that barn or that bridge or that other trailer I had somewhere or those motorcycles I had in there or that mower that I just bought or my my dog run that I just made for Chaga. My house is completely gone. My truck, it looked like Chernobyl exploded it. It was, uh, it was rough, rough. Uh, and, and also something that anyone grieving anything, I would just say, don't try to push it away. Just face it straight on, straight on, straight on. Straight on. Just face it straight on. A lot of us don't even know what that means by facing something like this straight on. How do we grieve? Do we even grieve? Do we even deal with the pain that's inside us? There's something that we do when we're uncomfortable as people, I think. And we avoid emotional pain. We don't want to be vulnerable. So we run around uh, pretending everything's good. And uh, one of my instructors and my master's in psychology program called it spiritual bypass. We just want to jump over all the uncomfortable and get to like, it's all good. We're all one. We're all connected. Fuck you. I've got fucking pain here. And if I mean, when I say turn into it, just say yes to all of it. Let it happen. And you don't have control over what that grief is. Turning into that is fucking powerful and painful, but I'd rather deal with it and allow it than shove it down somewhere in my soul and being and body and have it manifest in pain, anger, resentment. And what occurred for me was I moved through that pretty fast because I I did just say, okay, let me feel all of it without putting a judgment on it. Let me feel it. And then through that, I'd have these moments, these sparks of absolute fucking amazing clarity. It was like, a shooting star would shoot by my grief and I'd be like, Oh fuck. What was that? What was that? (gasps) And all of a sudden I just have more and more and more of those shooting stars through my grief. And I'm like, I'm starting to have visions now. I'm starting to see my property. I'm starting to feel what it's like as a result of this. I'm starting to understand what I'm going to do on the property. What is the, what is the opportunity that is presenting itself as a result of completely going through this grief. It was a little weird because I'd see a lot of people, obviously I knew a lot of friends that were grieving their losses too. And people were, it was despair around. And I'm like going, well, yeah, it sucked. And I've gotten through a lot of that stuff, but now I'm fucking excited. It's weird to have excitement along with loss sharing space 
but the result of this is my life had changed and that's a whole nother uh, i'm stoked i i would obviously i don't recommend being a minimalist by way of everything burning but i wouldn't take it back now because the depth of who i am the depths of what i perceive the depths of my commitment to this planet and to people and health in it has only exponentially gotten stronger so i would never want that to be taken away um so not that i had control over but i'd burn my house down again to be able to feel how immensely connected I am to myself and to what I'm committed to doing in this probably for the rest of my life. Hearing what Darren has to say about how he dealt with grief reminds me of volume seven when Kelsey Ramson talked about how her experience with cancer changed her mindset towards her life. But I, I can't believe how much of my life I spent pursuing things that didn't actually matter to me. And then that fine moment where you realize this is just a quick little ride on the marble. You get to go, man, how about I pursue some things that matter to me and forget about all this other stuff. In a few minutes, that last line will make a lot of sense with you understanding Darren and the responsibility he puts on himself. But before that, Darren said something really phenomenal about going through emotions. We're all running around as humans with pain, fear, anger, resentment. You don't get to not have that in your life. That's a part of it. So why not understand it and move through it rather than living with it? But I've been practicing for as long as I've been aware of trying to confront elephants in the room, trying to be honest and open and curating the understanding of me, myself as a spiritual being living in this life. You're going to deal with all of the emotions when you have to shut down a business or you failed at something. You have to deal with the emotions. And it's not living in the emotions, it's allowing the emotions to move through without judgment. Mindfulness trains us to welcome our emotions and not react immediately or impulsively. This training allows for greater cognitive flexibility, which can lead to greater freedom of action and greater adaptability. Darren, you were saying something about allowing the emotions to move through you without judgment. Can you talk a little bit more about that? When you allow that to occur without needing to do anything with it, I really believe then that the space will open up for opportunity. And it's first the mindset. I do not believe that things happen to me and I am not a part of it. I take responsibility for myself and my life 100%. And if I'm not consciously aware of something that's occurring, on some level, I am aware of it. And I just don't know it yet. That is a fundamental side of it. So even before the house burned and my father died and all the big events in my life, fundamentally, I know that the universe has always got my back to unfold the level of consciousness in me to open me up to a level of spirit, love, compassion, kindness, grace that I don't know yet. And if that's my modus operandi of how I live, then it's just, again, the, the opportunity to move through the grief so that I can yet be on another level of consciousness that is ultimately the most fulfilling and rewarding to my life because it's like I'm looking at this door right now. If I'm not willing to go into the pain and open that door, 
I don't get to see what's on that other side. I don't get it. And then you live in this little room here and that's it. And we all want to control our room. We all want to live a certain way and have this and this and this is who I am. So I'm not going to do this and I'm going to control that. But if you're not willing to face the challenges, the pain, the fear, the anger, the resentment, if you're not willing to face it, this is as good as it gets. And I just don't believe that. I'm like, the more I do it, the more I know I need to do it. The more I know that on the other side of it, I'm going to be happier. And maybe better word is more joyful, Mm -hmm. more content, more conscious, more fulfilled. 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 More joyful, more content, more conscious, more fulfilled. You know what, Darren? That sounds super fluffy. Does profit in business count at all? Part of the circle or spoke of a wheel, profit has to be one of them. But we're so goddamn focused on that. It has to be. You have to figure out that is this truly sustainable from an economic standpoint or else you're just begging for money all the time. So for sure, you need to acknowledge that from a business perspective. But I think we don't give enough emphasis to foundational principles of our business. Who's working for us? What's their why? What's our why? Why why are we actually doing this? If you're not honest with yourself and going, this is for money, then that's to the degree at which you're limiting your entire business. So just know you're going to struggle. You're just going to struggle. There is no hiding the fact that Darren cares about sustainability above all else. It's ultimately more sustainable when you're truly honest with what you're wanting to do this from. So I think people lack the investigation on that front. And number two, doing the work that sucks. And the work that sucks is building these other pillars up, not just How do I get the best influencer to do all this other stuff? Well, what about your other aspects of your business? What's it for? Like, is it a service? Is it, is it giving something to, is it, is it better? Is your footprint of doing this going to make life better, the environment better, people better? If it isn't hitting something that's absolutely meaningful, what the fuck are you doing? If you want to, if you're into a thing and you're making money on it, great, good. But what are you doing with that money? That's an energy form. Do something with it. So I think just it plagues entrepreneurial people, it plagues business people, it plagues humans to investigate their reasons for doing things. And that takes vulnerability of yourself. It takes openness to other people and feedback because once you know your why once you know absolutely why i'm doing this and is it connected to my heart and soul then the criticism becomes fuel not oh i shouldn't do this fuck that shit it becomes the fact that you are coming at me gives me a greater and deeper reason that I am absolutely going to do it. And don't pay them any more attention than that. So, you know, anyone doing any business, any creating anything, if you get hit with some resistance, which you will, and you fold, then you already know. You don't have the deepest why that you need. So take that on. So it's all about every opportunity to investigate the opportunity. Psychology of Entrepreneurship. Coming up on the Psychology of Entrepreneurship. I know that I am a very vulnerable person in general. And that's the funny part. Like, there's nothing wrong with failing. There's something wrong with, like, not sticking to what got you there, not being yourself, because that's when things get off. Like, things are lighting up in your brain and it feels good and you just want to repeat that. Uh, I don't know about you, but I like orgasms. Um, 
but part of it is just like when it comes to work stuff because I, I don't make it my end all be all this is this is what I do for a living not who I am and I, I like to think that I'm good at what I do right? I don't feel or find myself self-important enough that I need to discuss those things well, what's the impact you want to leave on people I interviewed Darren because he is often called the Indiana Jones of superfoods. He has formulated the comprehensive plant-based ultimate reset 21-day detoxification program, which has a registered trademark under it. He works with fitness company Beachbody to formulate the popular whole food supplement Shakeology. He studied physiology and nutrition and now holds a bachelor degree in this field as well as a master's in psychology. He is the author of Super Life, the five forces that will make you healthy, fit, and eternally awesome. Darren is widely recognized as an exotic superfood hunter, supplement formulator, and environmental activist who travels the planet discovering new and underutilized medicinal plants. He formulates for other companies the latest and rare superfoods from around the world. He is a philosopher a creature of this land and a friend. Psychology of Entrepreneurship. This is a Must Amplify production. Special thanks to every guest expert that has appeared on the show. Editing and sound design by Kelly Bonniman, Joel Thomas, and Nemanja Bakovic. Voiceovers by Kelly Bonniman. Guest research and content by Claire Gould and Corinne Castles. Project managed by Shannon Morrison. Produced and hosted by me, Ron Sleepers. For more episodes and where to listen, go to mustamplify.com slash P-O-E. Hey. hey, it's Kaylee from Must Amplify. I'm the sound engineer for this volume of Psychology of Entrepreneurship. I'm a part of the team that made this production come alive. Our team consists of members from all around the globe, with our headquarters based in West End, Brisbane, Australia, the land of the drop bear. For more about the cool stuff that we're up to and to work out of our studios, head to mustamplify.com. Are you still listening? Here's a little gift to you for sticking around. Which can lead to greater freedom of action and greater ap- adaptability. To wipe out the Awa, which is a tribe of th- 300. This fucking stat is so depressing. Hearing what Darren has to say about, oh my God, I can't speak. Sorry, I'm sick. Apparently there's 